Uh, I'm Tim Stelmach. I was employee number six or nine or something at Looking Glass, so I was there quite early. This would be starting on Ultimate Underworld 1, actually, when I was in Playtest. I started in the design role as lead designer on Underworld 2. What, what years were these, just, just to get a little context? Must have been 91 or 92 on <laughs> Underworld 1. Um, yeah, it, it would be 1991. Uh, and I guess must have been for Underworld 2, which was sort of my, my first, my, the first time that I really had, had authorial input, really. Uh, you know, the, there's an extent to which you have that in playtest, but it's pretty limited. Uh, so that would, that would be 90, I don't know, 92, 93, long time ago now. Uh, and uh, then I was also one of the designers on, on Terra Nova and System Shock. I was lead designer on Thief and Thief 2. So, so the games in order would be, just, just for clarity's sake? Underworld 1, Underworld 2. Terra Nova, System Shock, System Shock, Terra Nova, <laughs> right? Like it was a long time ago. And and and, uh, just, and, and then Thief and Thief Two. Okay, and then just just also for for the sake of clarity, like your if you had to just say like what your role was in each one of those two, it was like the actual title role was so it was like tester in Underworld One. Test tester in Underworld One, and uh, lead designer in Underworld Two. Okay. On System Shock, I was. I don't, I don't know if we had a lead designer on System Shock. It was more, more just the, a a cabal, as as Valve would have put it. Uh, and on Terra Nova, I was a a designer and programmer. I did some of the the tools and user interface and stuff in, in those days. And Thief, both games, I was lead designer on those. Okay, um, is that it for your? Intro, and uh, that's all I can think anything of. else you want to say? Okay, yeah. you can go to Laura. Um, I'm Laura Baldwin. I came in to Looking Glass pretty late. Uh, I've been trying to count on my fingers here, and probably about '97. Uh, I worked on Thief and System Shock Two, and then Thief Two. Um, I was sort of a a backfield designer. Um, I didn't. I uh, I was only half time, so I didn't do any. I wasn't in charge of any levels. Uh, but what I would a lot of the stuff that I did was sort of dialogue, um, you know, okay, come up with 10 different ways for a guard to say, you know, I think maybe I've heard something. And mm -hmm. uh, then 10 more ways for them to have maybe maybe seen something or, or I know when they've definitely seen something. Um, so that, that was a lot of writing into spreadsheets. Uh, I did conversations. Um, I did a lot of sort of random things like editing mo motion captures. Um, I guess I have three authorial things I'm proud of. Uh, I did the Bear Pits conversation at the beginning of the... Oh, man. Um, I uh, came up with the word Taffer, and I did the doggerel that the trickster says at the end of Thief because there was this big ritual, but he wasn't saying anything, and it was like... Oh, he, 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 he has to have a... It's yeah. a ritual. He has to say something. Um, and then probably my favorite thing was when that got translated and the audio recordings came back with the people in French, um, you know, or, and people in German saying these poems that I had written that had been translated into French and German and still rhymed being said by people, and that was really cool. Yeah, because rhyming, I know, was a big part of, of, of the whole trickster aspect yeah. of the story and everything, so that was very cool. Uh, and the, and the, the Bear Pits conversation is literally the first thing you hear in the game, right? I mean, like, you start the game and... There's, there's some... During gameplay, yeah. Yeah, during, during gameplay. There's, 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 there's a game. briefing and stuff before But I mean, like, if, you just, voiceover, if you just start the level, like, that's the first thing you hear, even in the demo. Yes. Yeah. So, I think everybody remembers that. And it's actually one of the longer conversations. Pretty much everything else got cut to four lines because otherwise it, you know, it just took up too much time. But the bear pits got to stay longer so that people could, you know, go and listen to it. <laughs> I guess. So. Cool. Um, is that it for you? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's me. And, um, Okay, um, I joined Looking Glass just a little bit before Laura. Uh, I did play test on System Shock One, and then I was a lead play tester on many of their other games, uh, either Solar Joint, Flight Unlimited, Terra Nova, um, and then on Thief. As a matter of fact, I started out as the lead play tester. And then, you tried to quit, and we had to stop you. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then I tried to quit Looking Glass because I was kind of tired of being a lead tester. 
Um, <laughs> or at that point, I think I was actually the quality assurance supervisor was the actual title, um, which meant I was getting further and further from playing games and more and more from telling people to play games. Um, and that got me shifted into a designer position on Thief. And then I was the lead designer on the Thief Gold project and the lead designer on the Thief Gold 2 project, which promptly got canceled on us, which is about the time Looking Glass went out of business. Uh, speaking of which, um, I was uh, recently, I recently saw the, um, on your website, Tim, the, uh, the videos. Oh, from the, the, from fi the, the final day videos that Mike Krasowski did? Which apparently had been, you put up only recently. Or, or oh, you, well, you was, posted was, recently. Yes, well, was Mike Krasowski did the videos, and he had them at, at one time, I don't know if it was on his personal website or what, but only recently he, he got them converted over and got them all up on YouTube. Uh, around the time of, of the 10th anniversary of Looking Glass closing down. And that was, I think, the first time when they really got spread widely. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot more feedback to them when he did that. So. Yeah, it was just it was interesting that you mentioned it, because I, I, I looked at a few of them, and, and, and I know <laughs> that. Uh, and uh, there is, and in fact, I, you mentioned being forgetful before, or like hoping you can remember stuff that happened like oh, yeah. 15 years ago. But I think you even said that, because there's something with Mach LeBlanc in the um, videos talking about the, the severed the, heads, the severed head, the, the puzzle in System Shock 1. Where you I always loved that separate. puzzle and I found out by watching the videos that I helped come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, has, he has a story about you're driving, you're somewhere you know, on the road and you have this idea because yeah. it's like really late or really early. Or yeah, we were, we were coming home from the office. I, I, I think it didn't count as late at night anymore according to his, and again, this is like, Mach remembers this and I do not. Uh, and it may be that I don't remember it because we had been up all night yeah, and yeah. nothing was really going on in my brain at the time except apparently helping come up with this severed head puzzle. The severed head puzzle being that we had these severed heads laying around on Citadel Station in System Shock to show all the violence that had happened pre-game when Shodan had taken over the station. And, and somehow we came up the, with the idea that these... These heads had to be a puzzle somehow. And in fact, I think we already by that time had art associated with each one, inventory art. So if you picked one up and put it in your inventory, you would get a shot of one of the developers, basically, in severed head form. And, and we just loved that so much that we just had to call attention to it, I guess, was the point. Uh, and and our, our means of doing that was, of course, a retina scanner that... That, that locked down a door that you wanted to get through. So you had to actually find the person who was authorized to go through that door and bring their head to the retina you scanner. You had to right, the right severed head. Yes. Because there's yes, a lot was a, of was, heads. <laughs> quite a few, yeah. There was, so there was, there was a specific one you had to find. I think the idea was that, was that you, the, there was a log. The audio logs had, had portraits of, the, of the, the speaker as well. And so you had to match up the, the portrait and the audio log with the inventory image of the severed head and, to figure out who was the right person to... And if I recall correctly, the audio log also gave some hint as to yes. where that particular person had been. So yes, it was, there the, it was the log that, that would let you know that that yeah. person was authorized. Yeah, and, and, and you it had also to said the where image he, in that yeah, log. And, and he was working in this location. Right. So then that would tell you sort of where to go to look through the severed head so you didn't have to look through everything, every single head in the station. Yeah. And I totally don't remember having had any part coming up with that. <laughs> well, I feel like this is so. a really, really good segue to one of the, one of the things I, I, I wanted to hear, hear more about, which is the whole, like, because that's a really memorable moment from that game, mm -hmm. or a really memorable puzzle, or a really memorable aspect that's really well integrated into the fictional universe of, of the game and everything. It's not like a, one of those Resident Evil puzzles where it's like, oh, here's a statue that sort of is just here, right? <laughs> now you have to like, right. flip some switches on it, and why did anybody build this? Because obviously no would be, nobody would be able to get around the mansion if this was really here. So, right. so one of the things I remember about playing that game at the time is it was so... It's like the game design, the world design, and everything was so fictionally meshed together. Yes. And well, and that has to do with the process that that what that occurred to develop it. It wasn't a puzzle that had been thought out ahead of time, you know, and the elements in the game meant to fit it. And there's a whole lot to be said about this entire topic when it comes to Thief, because Thief One and Thief Two were very different in that specific regard. But you know, it was it was an element that came out of work that we had been doing on the game, and so so naturally it was it was you know it was very closely integrated into into what was going on in the in the game world because it emerged from that through you know the process of, of iteration as we went through the game, 
elements that that were that were present there that inspired us to include this puzzle. So, so from a development process point of view, was it like the game world was designed first, then largely? I mean, what were the original ideas? Was it just like, hey, we want to have a space station, we want to have a bunch of dead people in it, and uh, and we'll figure out the puzzles later? That or? was that was literally the very first thing that I remember, <laughs> and it was a reaction to the Underworld games that we were sort of constantly chafing against the limitations of conversation systems and their their inability to be more than sort of thematically like conversations, right? Like a conversation, even in, even in RPGs today, right? The, the most common model there is that you have some menu of utterances that you can say at any given time, and that will lead you through this sort of graph of possible paths in the conversation. And that's not really very much like having an actual conversation. It's really more a mini game that's themed on conversations. And, um, and I think, Probably Doug in particular was sick of that. I mean, Doug has always been very interested in this problem of how, of how to model character in game. And so after two games of doing that sort of thing in Underworld, uh, there was the idea in System Shock to just sort of, sort of, you know, sort of apply some Aikido to the problem and, you know, doctor, this hurts. Well, don't do that. So the solution in System Shock, of course, is anyone who's played it knows, is there are no conversations because all the NPCs start off the game dead. Um, and you, you, you get to know them, but you do so through these, these logs that they left behind and the, the disasters that, that, that happened all pre-game, uh, which, you know, continuing to this day, if you play the Bioshock games, it's exactly the same kind of, of narrative model. Um, and... What was the question now? Oh, the, the question was, um, it seems to me like what, oh, you're, right. like what you're saying is like the, the kind of the puzzle design of the game emerged out more of a desire to design a believable seamless Yeah, well, world. Even, even not just puzzle design specifically, but like that whole sort of game system design, right? Like the decision to have audio logs as opposed to a conversation system, right? Came from, from this, sort of, this sort of narrative decision. Um, or, or vice versa, actually, right? The, the narrative decision to like have to have the, like this pregame disaster that wiped different out was based on this this limitation of what we wanted to be able to attempt in the game. This this actually reminds me of something that that, that Austin said last time, where he was saying that a part of this idea came from Underworld Two, which you said you you also worked on, where he said that there was one. For, for people who might not know, Underworld 2 is, uh, has several different worlds in it, and um, one of them was a, a tomb where everybody was dead. Right. And he was actually saying in some sense um, System Shock was kind of almost like extending that idea, maybe the kernel of that idea is kind of in... Uh, you know, I, I hadn't thought of that, but but, uh, but I don't have anything to say against it either. I mean, the, the thing about Underworld 2 in that regard is the need to make the worlds that you that you went through distinct from each other kind of led to a certain amount of, of stylistic experimentation mm -hmm. you know in order to in order to, to draw those distinctions um, so so yeah I, I, it, it's very natural then you know to, that and I, I don't even know if I thought about that time but I've, I've, I've wouldn't be at all surprised if Austin did. I mean, he was the writer. <laughs> yeah, well, he, was, he, he, he explained it in that way, which I thought was interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought yeah, of it. No. Right. Yeah, no. Um, well, speaking of, speaking of dialogue and the problem of dialogue, I, I, I thought it might be interesting to hear some of Laura's ideas about this, because I know that so like your job was to write dialogue for the, this kind of, as almost like an extension. So Thief was kind of one of the following games that's kind of revising some of these mm -hmm. similar concepts, right? right. So like, Where everyone's and, alive, but you don't actually talk don't to talk any to of them. them. You, yeah. you, you eavesdrop on them. Yeah, so, 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 so it, I, uh, to me that always felt like an extension of, of trying to look for a solution. It's like, how, okay, so one solution was killing people and finding recordings. It's like, okay, so how do we do it without having people dead? They're alive, they're talking to each other, but you can't talk to them. Was that conscious or was that not some? Cause I, 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 th I think yes. Um, but, but I don't want to. I mean, I. I didn't actually have to I, execute it. I wasn't. So. <laughs> I wasn't a, you know a designer. I was sort of a, a task carry outer. But I, I do think that that there you know back in the early evolution of games there there were adventure games sort of the first you know you wander around and do things and role playing computer role playing games which are not really like role playing games sprang out of that and. In an adventure game, everything is very limited. You, there are four things in the room that you can interact with, and they can only interact with each other and you. And 
role playing computer role playing games, there's a lot more sort of freedom to wander around and poke at things. But the dialogue or the, the conversation systems, I think, is still very adventure like. There are you know there are four things you can say to this person, and then they can only say those things back to you. Um, yeah, I, I, when I was brought on, there were, it was already a sneaker at, at, at that point. So I think there were, there was never really going to be any conversations with with Garrett talking to the NPCs. Um, but it did. I mean, we wanted it to feel like a world where these pe- where these were actual people. You know, they had motion captures for st- standing around and sort of fidgeting um, to make them seem like people you were sneaking by and people who were who got bored and. And if they were going to be, you know, emitting these utterances every so often, saying, "Oh, I've noticed something. Oh, I'm looking for something. Oh, I, I, I've decided I'm not looking for something anymore," they kind of had to be talky, and then they had to be at least a little bit talky to each other, so that they felt, so that the fact that they kept saying, "Right," it makes sense. them more authentic. I mean, and, yeah. and and that is a really good observation. The the needs of the gameplay in Thief mean that the NPCs have to be real, really chatterboxes. <laughs> about all of their like innermost feelings and observations, right? Because that's how you can tell what their AI state is. The it's, whole, it's a feedback system. Yeah, the whole point of the game is to outsmart these these AI on some level, and and this is the information that you're using to do so. And but also, if that was all they ever talked about, it would be really unnatural. But And also sometimes you're getting information from them. It's like, what are different sneaky-type, thiefy things you can do? You can steal stuff, you can steal information documents, you can overhear information, and I think... That, that gave you another thing to be doing when you were sneaking around is get as close as possible so you could hear them and overhear, you know, often it, often their dialogue had you know, clues kind of about where something was. Shakespearean so. about the convenience of eaves, eavesdropping in, in, in the fright. In, in Shakespeare, somebody's always talking and somebody's always like, somebody's always yeah. speaking in earshot of, of, of an important yes. character, yeah. right? You know? Yes. And, but, it, I mean, for, what struck me playing it is that... Uh, I don't know, it's very believable to, to me the way, and I don't know if it's just quality yes. of writing or quality of acting, because there's a lot of games where, where the, the amazing thing for me about Thief 1, and I know that people have, some people complain like, the, oh, the AI is dumb, it's like, why would anybody do that? And But for me, like, there was something about the way the characters were stupid that seemed very believable. <laughs> like, 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 you know what I mean? And, yes. and, and in some ways, like, years later, I was thinking, like, why do I like this game so much? And there's something about Thief 1 that almost feels like, like a nerd revenge fantasy to me, because What's it about? It's about kind right. of like this weak, smart, kind of witty character. Yes, and the bear pit, the bear pit, the bear pit conversation sets all of that up as well, right? It's the very first conversation you you eavesdrop on, and it one of its purposes is just to sell what buffoons the guards no, no, are. No, no, exactly, yeah. Um, and and they're meant to be. I mean, when people say that they're that they are stupid, like, well, it's a game about outsmarting the guards. What do you expect? I mean, if they outsmarted you, it wouldn't be very much of a game. Well, and, and there's a certain, yeah, I guess, and I guess to me that's an interesting, that brings up interesting topics about the interrelation of like characterization, voice acting, writing, and game design, specifically in relation to AI design, right? Because the AI design and the voice acting and the writing and everything kind of mesh to create something that, to me at least, doesn't feel broken. It feels like it's expressing something coherent about a fictional world. And, mm-hmm. That's one of the really interesting things. Well, and your question about about the the writing and and the acting and such, I think that's also, to some degree, that's that's tied into the the gameplay structure as well. Structurally, the the overheard conversations in Thief are are a lot like the audio logs in System Shock or in Bioshock, right? You come across them, you listen to them. The big difference is you don't get to listen to them again, and you can interrupt them, right? And the fact that you can interrupt them actually is one of the things that that motivates the the effort that we put into some aspects of it. I mean, if we want you to to, to stop and and well, or, or slow down and and take in these conversations, we need to motivate you to do that. And one of the ways that you do that is that you embed some of the conversations with useful hints about how you might approach your mission, but also you need to make them really entertaining, right? They need to pay off on their own terms if the player is going to going to sort of set aside their other activity and listen to them. Um, and so that was one thing that we had very yeah, specific discussions about. You can't click through and read the subtitles of. <laughs> right. Um, and we, I, remember, I remember talking about that very specifically during the development of Thief. It's like, we really need to make these conversations worth listening to. And when was that? And that was your job. 
Um, often, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make them, so they were like, well, we need to make yeah. these great, so you know, make, make them great. So. I, yeah, try to make them entertaining and very short. And yeah. so, so where does where does Taffer come from? Was that was that your solution? Um, sort of, um, we need to be entertaining. So, like, you try to give them some personality, or like, where does that come from? That actually that comes sort of from an, an original evolution. The a lot of the dialogue was, um, I think it was Greg Lepicolo's theory was there should be sort of a, an argot, a thief's cant that, you know, everyone was speaking and there would be there would be words for all sorts of things. You wouldn't say here. You'd say. You'd, There'd be something for that. There'd be yeah. eagle. I think was. I for, think that was for, correct. For I, yeah. For I saw something, and so I, you know, I read. I read all these like long things. You know, I eagled something, and then the playtester is like, "We don't understand what they're saying. This is no good." <laughs> and when the when the NPCs are supposed to be conveying information to you about how about their state, it, it really can't be that unclear. And so then I went. Through, you know, I had to go through and take out all of these you know made up words. But Taffer was the only one that really stayed. And. Often I would use it kind of as a as a swear word, you know, who's the taffer who's who's been who's, who's taffing around? Yeah, who's taffing around there? Yeah, you know, who's right. the taffer who, who who did that? Because you know these are they're guards. They're they're not very bright. They're 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 probably going to be swearing. But you know, we're trying to have a game that doesn't have swear words in it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that just became the placeholder for the swear word. And you can make it a verb. You can make it a noun. You can do all sorts of things. And Much like real swear words. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, so and sorry, it eventually I came up with a sort of a back construction for it, um, which is th there's some hammers hammerites that are talking to each other later. You know, one of the hammerites says something something taffer, and the other hammerite is like, "Don't say that. That's a, that's derived from the trickster." You know, um, and when you say his name, you give him power. Don't do that. Um, I don't even know if that one made it into the game, but it was you know in one of my spreadsheets somewhere. So that's, that's actually, so this is really fascinating to me. One of the reasons why I would play a game like that and sort of imagine a singular author behind it who had everything figured out is because that level of coherence between a small detail like that contributing to the overall world design of the game. Because what you're talking about is writing interesting dialogue, but you're also talking about fictional world flushing out, right? You're sort of deepening the fictional yes. world, you're creating a mythology. And one of the things that really struck me about Thief is it creates a really interesting mythology very quickly. And uh, with not and without sitting you down and just telling it to you. Yes. And um, I, I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about like how that came because because I love that world, I love the characters, and it, and there's that whole kind of uh, uh, you know nature versus technology theme. But but and I know that like lots of things have that theme, but in that game it felt very I don't know original to me. It's got like the, the steampunk, the kind of low fantasy medievalism, and I'm wondering like where did that come from? Is, is it one person? Is it two people? Was it an accident? Was it sort of an accident? Um, wow. It, it was not just one person, though. I would, I, would, I would lay its origins, I think, probably at, at the feet of, of Ken Levine. If you look at that kind of retro tech kind of style, you see the same sort of thing in Bioshock, right? Um, <laughs> it's not the same retro tech, but... but the original concept doc for Thief had a lot more focus on, on the use of elementals as power sources and these, these sort of background elements, uh, no pun intended, having to do with the Hammerites and, and their role in the world. And the, the trickster kind of came as counterpoint to that in a pretty obvious way. And in some sense, we didn't want the, the player character to be, to be sort of clearly on one side or the other of, the, of that. Um, Garrett sort of works much better in, in sort of a, a more moral, morally ambiguous kind of it, so area. Is that where Garrett comes from as a character, like his characterization? Like his characterization is sort, of, is sort of... A lot of it comes, comes as um, sort of in the role of a chorus. I and mean, he's, he's there in, 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 in large degree to sort of comment on the Hammerites and the trickster and their conflict and the futility of all of it. And in some sense, the, 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 the way that I see it, like we kind of identified the, you know, the Hammerites as, as, as a force of order and the trickster as a force of chaos, right, in opposition to each other. But they're both sort of forces of faith. And against that, Garrett is more sort of, of reason. Right, and so there's this sort of triangle of, of ideologies going on there, so so that things are a little bit more, I hope, kind of nuanced um, in the story of Thief. Certainly seems to. I um, certainly agree. 
but I think that that kind of started all from from the concept of the hammers as the as sort of the initial and primary enemy that that came out of of Ken's concept documents. At least that's you know that's that's my recollection of of the, the sort of arc that we went through developing all of those elements. That, that also kind of so so who who was so I know you wrote um, sort of it sounds like. What writing did you do other than the kind of the character dialogue, or is that um, the main thing you did? Or that, yeah, that's the main thing I did. I, I mean, I, I think I did work on the manual, and um, but it was mostly stuff people said. The right. stuff, the stuff people, which said. is a lot of what actually you know what actually communicates the, the story in that in that game, and that was one of the one of the things that we were trying to do specifically was to have multiple channels of narrative going on. You know, between the overheard conversations and the briefings and the lore objects that you could find in the missions, um, and I you know I have a whole a whole list of, of more minor ones. Off There's also documents too, head, right? You pick up and read. Yeah. At some yeah, point. Yeah. That's where I remember there was one where where the trickster outlines his plan, which he calls the Dark Project. Which I, <laughs> which the way I read that, you can tell me if I'm wrong, was like we called this project. The Dark Project, yes. the game, and then we just wanted to rationalize a way to use that Absolutely. in the game. Yes. That is entirely correct. <laughs> and we didn't even... Mess. It's because we couldn't come up with a better name for the game. Yes, it was yeah. a code name. It was, yeah. And it was from back when we were working on an entirely different concept pitch, which was Dark Camelot, where you're in the role of Mordred, who's secretly a freedom fighter against the evil Arthur, and all this stuff that never got made. Um, the... All that all that was really retained from that was was the idea of the player character as sort of this, um, you know, l less sort of black and white hero, more kind of a Robin Hood figure. Um, and so, like, none of that happened. But the 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 the, con the, the concept pitch name Dark Camelot, when we when we threw out the, the concept, we 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 still had to refer to our. Team as something, right? So it just became the Dark Project because we didn't know what I, we, we didn't know what we were going to do, but we were we were you knew we, we were dark, and we knew we weren't the Dark Camelot team anymore. So we, it was just the Dark Project, and that somehow made it into the press materials, and then we couldn't we, we couldn't get rid of. I remember it after the first that. trailer I saw, which is the still on the game, is the intro, but it, it doesn't say Thief; it just says the Dark Project. Right. Yes. And, uh, and, and so the Dark Project had to become the subtitle when we, <laughs> we finally had a title. <laughs> because otherwise, just stuff otherwise we just would have confused our whole sales channel, <laughs> and then and then yeah, that the, the bit that you were talking about was like let's let's get this dark project phrase into the game somehow. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting constraint to think that like we have to make a game. Well, what's your what, what does it have to be? Well, it's got to be dark, right? And then yeah. and then that's well, that, that stylistic decision actually it happened early on, and then but but even before we we, we settled on the concept of of, of the. The thief. It, well, it's interesting that the, the, the darkness. It's funny. I mean, it, it sounds funny to say, but, dark, but it is funny though. It's an in, it is an interesting constraint because the gameplay is all about darkness. Oh yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. it's it's about darkness as a useful gameplay instrument. Oh yeah. It, darkness is your friend. Which was which was uh, another really interesting thing at the time. And, mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, Sarah hasn't got a chance to talk yet, but uh, I know that you were doing um, uh, level design, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if. There's any you're having any, any thoughts about anything well, you want to contribute actually, to the conversation? I actually about, came on. on well, I came on as a designer really um, after Laura actually um, was already working on the project because um, I had seen um, almost most of the way we were. Were we in beta when I came I don't on, remember. or almost? I don't think we were quite in beta, um, but all of the levels had been built, and so what I actually was was much like much like Laura. I was a jack of all trades, fill in the blanks um, designer. And I, I took a couple of levels that had been built by artists, but who weren't going to populate and script them. And I ended up populating them and scripting right. them and so setting up the traps. So you're, you're, you're yeah. much more substantial yeah. roles. Yeah. So, yeah. Not, so not designing the, the space itself. Yeah, I did not, no, 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 physic, no really physical plan. design other than, yeah. oh, this needs to be tweaked here. Here's okay. a, some fixing small bugs. What, but would, what would you say your, um, I know that um, uh, uh, Tim and Laura just sort of, you talked about things that you felt um, you could, you felt authorial about about or had authorial connection to. Is there anything that comes to your mind? Like ah. if you say if you say like, most of see I, that's me in the game. Then. Most of what I had authorial con control over was uh, the gameplay of the levels I worked on. And which because, levels were those? Oh, good heavens! There were. <laughs> I, well, you don't have to list all of them. Yeah, no. The like, problem is I'm trying to remember. Much <laughs> like Tim has forgotten it all. I've forgotten it all. Um, there was the mansion level, 
when you break into uh, Constantine's mansion, and that level had pretty much no gameplay in it whatsoever. It was a really beautiful space. Kind of Escher-esque. Esch- right? Yeah, very yeah. Escher-esque. And there were like two traps set up. And then there was... <laughs> <laughs> then there was this, there was this vac- visual concept. Oh, it was, was a about, beautiful. That was about all that- it was a beautiful visual concept, but it didn't. It wasn't really clear how it linked in with story, other than hey, you're breaking into this to to, to advance your plot. Yeah. And then there was no gameplay set up in it whatsoever. And so and was like- I went from I went from playing the game to okay, I've been I've been dodging these things. Now can I set up <laughs> interesting inter- encounters? Um, so yeah, that is a crazy level. It is a crazy it level. It is extremely it was, crazy. I, I remember thinking, oh, holy, holy moly, this is the first level. <laughs> <laughs> this is, that was the first level I started on, too. I actually did some work on some of the other levels as well. And uh, in Thief 2, I did a fair bit of um, level design and cleanup as well. Um, I forgot to mention that I was a designer on level 2 as well. And you mentioned, you mentioned Thief Gold as well, too. And there, there's something in Thief Gold that, if I, if I remember correctly, is an interesting variation on the whole... We want to have dialogue. We want to have somebody who's alive, but who you can't interact with. I mean, am I? I, am I seem to I have this vague memory of it. There's one level in Thief Gold that's where it's a level that's not in the regular Thief, where you meet a drunk character who's like crazy and drunk or something. Do you remember that? It's like he's like he's standing right in front of you, like he's not dead and he's not trying to kill you because he's not a guard, but oh, he's just there, like there, been babbling incoherent. Isn't there a drunk in the back alley of one of the? I, like, I, I would have put him in the back alley of the first mission or something. Yeah, but I, I don't... Oh, no, no, yeah. There is a drunk... But I think the, the one in Thief Gold I'm specifically thinking of is a little bit more expository, deliberately, mm-hmm. whereas I think that... But that's actually what's really... That is really interesting when you yeah. mention that, because the first... Yeah, there, level, is, there is one in the, in the Lord Baffert mission as well. Yeah. Right? Well, well, yeah, because yeah. one of the things that's interesting about Thief 1 is... I think a lot of people forget is that that level kind of and some of the levels kind of start in a space where people actually aren't trying to kill you they're just like civilians right mm-hmm. it's just like people on the street and you're not actually doing any it's not like metal gear or something where you're behind enemy lines so anybody who sees you is going to try and shoot you it's like you actually have to break in somewhere before you're doing anything illegal and yeah there are drunks and there are kind of some of these other people out on the street too but there is a little bit of a subtle kind of going down the rabbit hole i think in the first level of thief where you're you can't yes. start, and I even think there's you break a, in. You break in through a well. In fact. Break in through a well. And you have to. You have to. And, and, and that's so. where you. And at that very first interaction, where you can decide whether you want to to try and distract the guards by sending them off on a on a on a hunt, or if you want to try and. Yes. Yeah. Also, I, when I had lunch with you, I was t- telling you about the level that I was going to work on. That I was working on for Thief Two Gold, which was the Hammerite mission when everyone's a mechanist, and that had a drunk Hammerite in it, and so. If, oh. I don't remember whether you actually remember playing and encountering this expository no, drunk or... No, 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 I do remember, I, I, okay. I do rem- I have a very vague memory of, uh, I think there's one of the extra levels in Thief Gold has uh, like an opera house in it. Yeah. Oh, and there's okay. like, and you come so, up to the opera house like through the ground and mm-hmm. there's like a drunk guy like near the hole. And, but he's saying something sort of important. It feels more like... like, like you know, Terry you know, might have written that. Because that was her I level, and she, and she, read, and she, she did, did some, of those, some of the co-writing yeah. as well. This yeah. is Terry um, um, Brosius. I mean, a lot of the levels had a lot of stuff that was written by the level designer. Um, e- either the, both the Garrett, the Garrett voiceovers as you were encountering things, um, or just dialogue. That, that and that was very much do. like the designers. Them. So you have a whole bunch of different people. How many designers... Um, would you say we're like working on? Because I know at the I rem- also remember the end credits where everybody's got the hood uh, and, and um, uh, hood on. And uh, but I remember that I think that people are credited with the individual levels they worked on in the credits, if I remember yeah. correctly. Right. And I know that, um, like for example, I, I seem to remember Randy Smith being like the person responsible for like the really weird, messed up horror levels, primarily. Uh, I might be wrong, but I, no, that's that kind sounds of my, about right. That's, kind that, of my that's about memory, right. But. Yeah, and, and yeah, it, he was it, the asylum it, in Thief Two. I think so, uh, but it was very much you know one level designer having primary responsibility for for a particular level, but also writing. Right, so, it's not just oh I built a level now you write something. No, they they they, yeah. were, they were definitely in on the writing yeah. of yeah. their level as well. Well, and that's I guess to me that's kind of what's fascinating about this question because I can I play a lot of games where it's like there was a hundred writers. It's like oh you think because like it's just all over the place, but Thief doesn't feel all over the place to me. It feels very directed and very right. coherent and. I don't know if um, 
it was it just that like everybody at the office was just on a really similar wavelength? Like were you just like all eating the same food? Was well, it part of it was I think that we we had good communication about what the what the style was, like what the what what those goals were. Um, Did you have like a Bible or something? Like was it written down, or was it just meetings, or was it more? There was there was an element of that. I mean, there was there was more written documentation than ever made it in the game. There was, and this is sort of another another interesting thing that I I generally like think is 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 a, is a good thing in games is you know there's stuff that you write not for the purposes of putting in the game but for the purpose of making sure that the stuff that does go in the game is all coherently related to one particular thing and the corollary of that is like that you don't have to you don't have to communicate your whole story by telling it to the player right you can leave gaps for them to fill in and you know with the knowledge that they might not all fill them in the same way as the other player did, but that's interesting, and more, it gives them something to talk about when they're on the discussion forums. I mean, <laughs> you know, they can they can they can form certain conclusions about what these things mean to them in the in the interstices of the stuff that that you did put in. Um, so, partly, I think it came out of 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 that idea of having of having sort of a a, a sort of consensus narrative built up fairly well within the team that was more specific than the stuff that that went in the game um, and if there were inconsistencies they, they they were more sort of in this in this higher level of detail that never actually made it in the game mm -hmm. um, so one, one thing that strikes me that's really interesting about that was when you say there's a lot of stuff that was made but didn't actually make it in mm -hmm. my first encounter with with that was um, opening up the CD for, for Thief and looking at all the voice files. And there's like 10% of what's on the CD you actually hear in the game. There's like a huge amount of like incidental oh. dialogue. Like there's like, oh, there's, oh. A, there's a guard down at the end no, of the lots hall. Lots of stuff that if I use a water the, arrow, you yes. know what I mean? And, but it's just like none of that's in the game. Yeah. And um, at, least, at least I haven't found it. And there's only very few moments yeah. where, and, and I'm just wondering like, I think was that? Sometimes it was play testing, you know, that people would say, some of the, you know, if Garrett is just saying something over and over as he's talking, then he starts to sound sort of like the guards who are just, you know, expostulating yes. at a drop of a hat. Mostly Garrett is taciturn and occasionally snarky, and he shouldn't say stuff unless it's either really useful or funny or, yes. you know, snide. Well, and the way the audio production works, too, it's so much harder to to go back and do pickup sessions based on feedback that the, the, the incentive there is to err on the side of writing and recording a lot more stuff than you think you're going to use, right? Because you can always pull out as a result of your playtest feedback. That's hard to put more audio in. Um, it is interesting because, yeah, lots of games have a voiceover, but, but abuse it, right? Or you hear it a lot or it plays over and over again. And I think Garrett speaks like, what is it, like four or five times through the whole game, but you really remember each time because it, mm -hmm. it's like exactly at the right moment that sort of creates a punctuating kind of character moment. And he always struck me as a really interesting character. And I'm wondering, like, did, um, Who's involved in the like the voice casting for that? Because the guy who did his voice seemed like really so like he had the writing and then like did the same did the people who were same people involved in part of the writing process do the voice direction or casting or like I'm just curious as to like how that because no, the, the, the direction and casting was was on the audiovisual team which would have been like Dan Thrawn and and his people, um, which was which was pretty much separate from the the writing. He worked he worked pretty closely with Terry when she was doing her the. She did. She did most of the. This is again Terry Brosius. Um, did the the cutscene authors authorship. Um, so they worked pretty closely together, but but he didn't work very directly with the mission people. Um, but uh, yeah, he it would have been it would have been I think Dan Theron and, and Greg Lopiclo on the on the on the first game, who did uh, the the voice direction and casting. Dan's also the the voice of the stupidest guard. Yes, Dan is a like a surprisingly good voice actor. Oh, the the, the 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 guy, the bear pits guy. Yeah, he's, he, he gets pit. named Benny, I think, in Thief Two because oh, okay. he was so popular. Yes. Yeah, he's kind of like the yeah. No, that's because because is it the one guy who reappears all the time? Like even well, if you kill him, he's Dan, back, right? Dan does several voices himself as well. Like in addition, to like like Benny the guard being a recurring character, but but Dan actually did several like guard characters and hammering mm -hmm. characters, as I recall. <laughs> And then um, Stephen Russell, who, who did the voice of Garrett, um, has a, a, like a very, a very wide range vocally in terms of like, like 
pitch and dialect and, 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 and accent and everything. Like, he, he, he did a surprising number of those characters. So he's, like, all over the place in the game, yeah. but you wouldn't know it. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Cool. I saw Stephen Russell in, the, in a Huntington play the other last season. It was oh, like, yeah? holy cow, that's Garrett. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he didn't sound like Garrett at all. He you know, had some... Well, yeah, jokes. because... Was he, was, he a, was he a stage guy, primarily? I don't remember what his, what his yeah. other work was, I, you know. Because that's the other, I mean, this, it, it sounds like a, it would be interesting to, to get the people who are sort of more directly involved in the day-to-day with that at, at mm-hmm. some point. But I'm, I'm just kind of interested in this topic because it's like so much of video game voice acting seems to come from the kind of like voice acting, like voice acting talent pool, which is like largely defined by like animation television animation, or at least comes from that kind of culture, and sure. and, and, and sometimes there was a, um, I know that, uh, uh, what's his name, Dennis Dyack uh, told me a story once about um, wanting to cast, uh, what was it, the original Legacy of Kane, and, and he asked for actors from, from one of the main talent people, and she's like, oh, I got all these people who worked on, like, the Jetsons, and, you know, who did all this kind of stuff, and he's like, well, Okay, well, who else you got? She's like, oh, I got these theater people. And he's like, well, why don't you give me the theater people? <laughs> like, we're, you know, we're making a kind of a serious adult game here and everything. So, right. um, so and I'm not saying that none. Of, I'm not saying that other voice acting is, is bad necessarily, but it just seems like there's there could be so much more. I don't know places to draw from for video game voice acting that it seems like people don't go to a lot of the time. Sure. Well, there were a lot of programmer voices too. I mean, not for the not for the really big voices. But. No, but we were still we were still using. The servants were. Uh, yeah. yeah, did we did like an open casting call on the team to see who we, we could get there? Which, which you could not do nowadays. What about? But what about? Um, what are this? But so this is also making me think of System Shock too. Isn't there a fair amount of? Oh, there was even more of it. Like like Shock. developer kind of voices was, in System Shock. It's like all over the place, right? Oh, System Shock was 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 entirely non-professional voices except for, um, except for Terry, uh, who did the voice of Shodan, um, and she was not. She was not primarily a, a voice actress. She was a, a singer, uh, but it, but at least she was professional. <laughs> <laughs> she was, as, as a person, as a, a voice performer, she was a professional. She had yes. a professional experience doing that. Yes. that's what she did. Okay. Well, I remember. Yeah, I don't know. I I remember um, that stuff quite a lot. I know. Um, Sarah, is that you were talking about the vo- the faces before. Right? You say you keep saying it's not your voice, but it's your. No, it's you're one not. of the faces and. I'm, I'm Rebecca Lance. You're like face. the you're like the um, the Ed Harris character in Apollo 13 in uh, in System Shock. You're like the person who helps you uh, through the whole game. Um, oh, that's my face. It's someone else's voice, as I said. But yeah, right. that's so your voice is in there. I have my voice is in there, but you're, I'm never weird. You're you're the character. All I remember is that you're the character that my character is leaving voicemail for. <laughs> <laughs> Like, can't make it to dinner because they're actors like <laughs> melting down or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was Char, Charlotte or something. Charlotte something, yeah. yeah. I just remember that I was I was Mark and I had to say, Char, this is Mark. <laughs> Listen, I just can't make it to dinner tonight because and you can go places from Time City and compare that what the I just said. About, the great thing about being voice actors is that now we're in IMDB for it, so we can connect ourselves to Kevin Bacon. That's true. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, my biggest I think my biggest role in any of the Looking Glass games was actually in Flight Unlimited where I'm the voice of all the airports oh I forgot that oh you weren't there's airports <laughs> I, well, I just remember I just remember the constantly crashing and then respawning and then <laughs> <laughs> If you manage to actually contact someone and say they want to land, and oh, you hear someone give you your flight numbers and, okay. and your runway numbers, that's uh, that's me. Okay. One of the things that interests me about the history of uh, the Looking Glass games is the um, the kind of non-first-person shooter evolution of the first-person immersive, kind of narratively rich game, whatever whatever you want to call it. And and um, and and of course, we do have stuff like Bioshock now, which is you know sort of an evolutionary offshoot, of course. Of that, but um, I guess uh, it, it's still kind of like, and, and to, to to its credit and popularity, can easily be identified as an FPS, where it's kind of harder to identify what a lot of the, a lot of the Looking Glass games were. And, and for me, that's awesome because I like that kind of that kind of richness. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's there's this whole argument about, and, and not that anyone's arguing it much these days, um, but when when System Track One was first out, you know, there were 
people who would object to other people calling it an RPG, and they'd end up in this big discussion about, like, is, is this an RPG? Um, and, you know, if it had been top-down and you'd been Link, for example, then it would have been an RPG. You know, almost the same yeah, design a, on paper. The, the big issues were, like, that, that there was no character sheet and that all the, all the character progression arc in terms of abilities over the course of the campaign had to do with getting more inventory items and not more stats or skills or things on your character sheet the way it was in level one. And if you look at that model, that's exactly the the the, the ability progression model in in like the Legend of Zelda games, right? Mm-hmm. Which no one argues about whether they're RPGs, right? But since we were in first person, like I guess no one thought of that or something. It was also early first person too, right? Where like, oh, yes. the conventions were kind of still solidifying and what exactly does first person mean was still really kind of under not it hadn't really solidified yet. Right. right? It was really right. Early. And 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 I think there was even fewer points of reference in those days. I mean, when number one came out, it was around it was a month or two after Wolfenstein 3D came out, right? And for the longest time, it was you know us and really really stripped down early id style run and gun type shooters, mm-hmm. right? Um, and if you look at even you know things that are squarely in the middle of the FPS market these days, there's a lot more to those game systems than was going on mm-hmm. in, you know, in Doom. At the very least, there's, you know, cover, for example. Um, so just the, the idea that there's, that there's a little bit more breadth in, the, in, the, in your choices when it comes to, you know, the first person is not, is not a, a genre, right? It's, it's, it's one element of your format, and mm-hmm. that's all, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily determine all these other genre decisions that in the early days, like, they're, it, it kind of seemed like people thought that that was the case because they only had a couple of examples to, mm-hmm. to draw from this in terms of you know, what the game could be. But, but even now, and even now it's kind of interesting and, and um, the, the way that those, the way that, even, in, even in, a, in System Shock 2, for example, there's a little bit more of a, and I know that wasn't Looking Glass entirely, but there's, mm-hmm. you're kind of going down, down a more kind of conventional RPG path, right? With oh, much more so. Like with the stats and everything like that. And one of the things that, um, is it really interesting to me about the um, the first system track is that kind of I don't I don't know what you would call them I, I tend to in conversation call them discrete tool based character advancement system right because sure. it's, it's about it's not it, your improvements are not sort of like levels of effectiveness of items uh, it's more like you know I have a thing and it does X yes and, much and I more, have it or I don't much more. Uh, Qualitative than quantitative, and it is very much like. It's interesting that you mentioned Zelda because that's yeah. very much what it's like. Yeah. It's almost like Zelda or or Metroid or or Metroid, which is actually why when the first Metroid Prime came out in two thousand two, I remember saying like, "Wow!" To to me, that was like, um, like a, almost like a sequel to System Shock because it was like the science fiction game where you know you had these. Right. Uh, it was tool based, right? Because right. Metroid, right? Because it was Metroid. I, I do have kind of a, a kind of a strange um, question, which is maybe. Um, this is like a fan question that I can't articulate in any other way. It's like, why is the lean so awesome in Thief? Because um, there are so many first-person games that have a lean. Like, it's a first-person game. I've got my blinders on. I'm playing in, like, an FPS with mouse look. And I go to do my lean, but the screen kind of goes... You know, just kind of like... There's something about the way that the screen moves. And I don't know if nowadays they try to map leans to some kind of polygonal character that's actually there like for body awareness or something because that may be and and I don't know and I'm just wondering like like I mean, one thing is that because there wasn't a model uh, you know you Garrett did not have a model he had he's a guy he's he a had arm. arms yeah, right an arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was sort of this 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 sort of very rough physics model for for Garrett he's a snowman um, just as you, uh, secretly in System Shock, you were also a snowman um, because at the time, you know, your physics system could not handle the kind of you know skinning. You know, pl- are you saying you're literally a snowman? Yes, you were a pair of spheres. Oh, okay. No, no, no. So in terms of what no, you're no, 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 thinking, like you're saying, I thought you put an actual snowman. On the like, he no. had buttons and a nose. No. Like, like, yeah. like, no, okay. though there is a there is a placeholder model for a box. for Gary in the game. Okay. You're you are sort of brown Mr. Potato Head looking rectangular kind of box. Oh, that's kind of awesome. Um, but <laughs> but no, in terms of your physics model, you're With a snowman. An um, <laughs> and and the one thing that that results in though is that is that the 
there's a lot there was a lot of control there over over the properties of that model because it was all done you know in house at looking glass you know by our physicists um, so you know to the extent that 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 came out well from a user interface point of view I, I think you know the credit probably goes just to the the degree of control that that, that they had. Um, the chopping but, motion, like all the stabbing and chopping motions, the fact that Garrett was a box as opposed to a person actually made it very difficult. Oh. We, we originally motion captured all sorts of stabbing and chopping and slashings, but when you, when you take just the arm part of that motion and try and play it, like if you're trying to imagine stabbing someone or chopping someone, if yeah. the rest of your torso is bolted into a frame, you know, you're not very... You're, you're yeah, very wussy. And, <laughs> and well, and what your arm is doing doesn't make sense anymore yeah, out of yeah. context of what your shoulders were doing, right? So, <laughs> so, so he has up, no shoulders. <laughs> yeah, so we ended um, up ripping out all the motion captures there because yeah. that just wasn't working. Though another thing about about just about leaning on that in that game, it, it sort of gets back to this kind of this this issue of the amount of iteration we were able to do in the in the development cycle there, and and you know the degree to which some of the features were were not planned ahead of time and were sort of it, like improvised during during the process um, and that's the the listening at doors which is only occasionally like really crucial but is often really useful and no other game that I know of ever does it which is if you you know if you lean sideways into a door you can hear what's going on, on the other side better than if you weren't doing that <laughs> you can actually like press your ear against a door and thief that's actually really interesting because <laughs> that's known fact I would almost um, call that like that's like an emergent verb in a sense, right? Because it's not like a verb that's so... It's yeah. like you just take there's an existing the, verb. There's no listen that door action that you yeah. can do, right? Like, it's leaning in such a way that it brings your upper snowman sphere. On, on the other side of the door, which into, blocks, which blocks into a, sound. Into a door. Yeah. And, 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 and this was, like, it's not the sort of thing you would go out of your way to support. I have to be honest <laughs> about that, right? But the fact that, that our sound propagation system in Thief was so good because we, we did not want to deceive you about where things that you were hearing mm -hmm. were right and so we, there was a lot of work put into making the, the sound propagation quite naturalistic right so the sound would propagate properly you know through doorways and not through you know solid walls and stuff but because of that like we had all this data so that we could you know attenuate sound when there was a closed door so that that wouldn't fool you like, okay, now that we're doing that, we could stop attenuating sound when you lean up against the door. Um, and I just, I, like I said, I don't know how much that actually gets used, but it's, it's just delightful that it was so easy to do and that we had this sort of inspiration to do it. Well, the, the um, I know that uh, when you talk about these kind of, uh, you realize these things are possible, you realize that it doesn't cost that much development-wise to actually... Because it feels like you mm -hmm. had put these pieces in place not for the purpose of doing this third thing. But oh, and if, if you'd proposed to, to, to do all that work for the purpose of listening at doors, you would have been insane. Yeah, but you just realized, like, oh, there's, like, all these dots. Yeah. All I'm going to do is connect right. these two, and the, this whole idea makes right. sense. And yes, which I'm, is like the severed heads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's anything, if anything else sort of jumps out to any of you that sort of, you know, feels like that. Uh, any other examples in the whole... Oh, whole process. I would. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I would. I'd be thinking about Thief Gold or Thief Two, though, because I mean that's the point where you have all this understanding about the system, right? And you can really, you can really sort of play with what it's what it's capable of a lot more than we were able to do on the. Is there one. anything you can maybe, um, maybe a better way to say it would be like? Is there anything that you feel like? Really wasn't planned from the beginning, but changed like a really because because I know that, that Sarah's mentioned to me multiple times that um, certain things in Thief like came together like really late uh, near the end of the process. Yes. And and I don't know if those were like, I mean, are some of those just like fortuitous things that happened or, or, because um, I, I know that for the first game, I know the, the um, what the game was changed, changed a lot. And, uh, yes. you know, that it kind of like, when it, when was the moment when it kind of became the thing that people know that it is like what confluence of elements, I guess would. Ooh. One of the things was like the initial AI was much more like a camera connected to the wheels, almost for the NPCs. They would see you and they would behave, and it as the I guess people playing it 
felt like it was sneaking, it became more clear that you actually had to have a more complicated AI where they had an internal state of how much they are aware of there being something out there and what they are doing based on that. You couldn't have this sort of simple AI that homes towards you until it doesn't see you anymore. Um, and I feel like, and then there was this long period where the AI was being ripped out and replaced with a better AI. And that was one of the, yeah. that was a turning point that I was there for as opposed to the ones before yes. that. Yes, well, and all, all of that also sort of represented um, a much narrower focus on stealth than than we originally identified. I mean, it, it, it would be easy to sort of look at the, at, at the, at the game now and, and just, you know, people often refer to it in terms of, of being, you know, one of the early, like, modern-style stealth games, right, where a few other things like Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid and, and uh, Commandos and some other, some other stealth games were coming out around that same time. But, you know, to start with, we had, we had much broader points of reference. You know, we were looking at the, like, Fritz Lieber's Fofford and the Grey Mouser stories, where, I mean, Fofford is not exactly sneaky. He's this hulking northern barbarian type guy. Um, and the thing that you draw from that is more sort of this pulp adventure kind of notion of a, of a thief. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, we've talked about a lot, where, where there's elements in, in Thief 1 that, um, that come from, from that, like the sort of Lost City stuff and the bricks and all this, all this stuff that, 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 that aren't playing as, as much into the, the stealth metaphor. Um, and, um, and that in Thief 2, you know, we, we got away from those and focused much more on just uh, the stealth game. Because in Thief 1, we, we, we hadn't identified that yet at the start as to, like, this is a stealth game. We started with, this is a thief game, and we were looking at, at different kinds of quite stuff. a lot of points of reference about, like, what a thief could be. And, and like, you know, Dungeons & Dragons was one of them, and, and the, the, the Fafra and Green Master stories. Um, and, you know, the Batman comics in terms of Except, it, except you know, Batman in the role of Garrett, not, not, you know, not a thief, but like that. That was that was a lot of the stealth element there. That it came actually from that. Um, that that's that's actually so. So I I, I know I've, I'm sorry, knows I've said this before, but um, I I definitely have, have gone on record saying that that Thief Two is a great game, but I do I have, am personally one of the few people I know who actually really liked that kind of more eclectic definition of being a thief. In I the like first the variety. Game. I I I I I certainly agree with that. Um, on the other hand, I felt like in Thief Two we had a, enough of an understanding of like of what our game system was capable of that that we were able to to that by exploring those possibilities we were able to still have a lot of variety even though we were sort of narrowing our oh, focus absolutely. a little bit. There, there's there's definitely I wouldn't definitely wouldn't say there's less variety in general in the second game. Right. I mean, there's like there's you push like in that narrower focus. You kind of push it farther and, and kind of deeper mm -hmm. in that in, in in that way under that one theme. A little bit more of the kind of like I don't know Ocean's Eleven, you know, kind of just like it's a heist, you know, kind of thing. And I remember in Thief Two, there's that amazing level where, of course, I always played on the hardest mode, but the, the, where you have to ghost, where you have to not knock anybody out. Oh, right. In the in the police station, which mm -hmm. is like insanely nail biting, and there's, but but I remember in the first game. Kind of like when I first played it, I was like, "Oh, cool! This is like the level where I'm the guy who's just sneaking into a guy's house." And oh my god, this is the level where I'm Indiana Jones. Yes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. And, and and I remember like I remember just finding that really thrilling. And there was a real sense in the first game of like, "What are they going to think of next?" Yes. And and there's that. And I don't know if you can tell me a little bit more about this, but there's like this amazing, amazingly weird level at the very end. And one of my pet peeves of a lot of games is when you've played the first level, you've played the whole you've, game. Yeah, sort of seen everything it has to offer. And and I think that in Thief, Thief One for me was surprising pretty much up until the end. There was like fresh ideas, like even in the second half of the game. And there's a level called Undercover, where like you dress up as a Hammerite, and right. then you have to like be in plain sight of other people. And I'm just wondering if you remember how that level came about, or was it just uh, like, what if we have a level where you're in a disguise? Because that's something that like the Hitman series. Like that didn't really get picked up in the stealth yeah. genre again until the Hitman series a few I don't, years later. I don't remember that level specifically. I remember sort of the the early development of the mission tree in general. That was one of our big goals. I in particular, and this sort of came came out of this this idea of having to explore what did it mean to be a thief, right? Because we didn't have a lot of of prior points of reference in video games to work from. Uh, 
And so, you know, I, I mentioned some, some other influences, but um, with regard to that specifically, one of the things that, that I remember at the time really thinking a lot about was, I don't know if anyone, anyone now remembers the, the game Thieves Guild by this like small press outfit called Game Lords. It was, it was uh, in the, I guess it must have been around 1980 in one of the, the early waves of post D&D kind of games where they were very much in a D&D type world and everything, but they were, but everyone was a thief, right? Um, and the problem with that is if you look at what D&D had been doing at the time in terms of their published adventures and everything, there was, there was no thieving going on, right? You had a thief character class who did no thieving in, you know, first edition D&D. Um, and so they kind of had to, they had, they had this, this problem when they did that game of, of really having to flesh out that idea a lot. It's like, okay, if we want people to be able to, to play that role and, you know, to have, to have some variety in our scenario, that's what we're going to do. So they, they actually, they actually, they, in their, in their printed supplements in Thieves Guild, they organized things by like these categories of thieving activity that you would do, right? Like they had a chapter, which was like pickpocket scenarios and armed robbery scenarios and burglary scenarios and tomb robbing. And, and, uh, and, and that actually, I went back to that at that time and like, and, and based on you know, not just that list, but we went and we started brainstorming, like what are all the sort of thievey things that you could do? Um, and I'm sure that the, that the disguise scenario you know, came out, came out of, of that, that process. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing about the... Anyway, yeah, that's just... A, and I know it's apples and oranges, right, as to kind of which kind of variety you prefer. And, mm -hmm. and it's, like I said, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with Thief 2, but I just know, I guess I know a lot of fans who are kind of down on Thief 1. They're just kind of like, oh, but I hated the zombies, you know, and, uh, and I, I love them, but I, again, again, I, I write about zombies. Yeah, I don't know if there's any final... I feel like this whole thing is basically just been about, um, like I said, the, for me, the whole thing is kind of about searching for authorship and like where, like, it's easy for like a big kind of, you know, guy who's presented in the press as being like an author of a game, kind of talking at a high level about why these things happen. But when I play games and really remember what makes them feel special to me, it, yeah. it's these smaller moments, right? It's like, right. who thought of the putting the severed head in the thing, right? Like, Which are are not central planning there. <laughs> well, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but, but in really good games, um, they feel like it. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? I, mean, I think that, to the extent that you have like an auteur in a, in a, in a game, and I, 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 I suspect that this is true of anything. Like, like their, their imprint comes as much from the, the sort of the environment that they create within the team where everyone can, can contribute their best work, you know, and, you know, um, and, you know, the, and, and they can focus that, right? But they're not going to be the one who, who, who actually like crafts each individual, you know, you know, essential element of the work, right? Um, you know, but it seems like the press still wants to give them credit for it. Well, yeah. Well, you need to give someone credit, right? And 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 the right person is going to bring out a lot better work than everyone. Like I, and you know, God bless Warren. Like my early experiences with him were like completely essential to learning, you know, everything that I did about about how to do this stuff, right? Um, and but you know, at the same time, you know. There's very few like specific things that went into the game that like you can point at that and say yeah that was Warren's idea right, mm -hmm. um, um, but you know like Hitchcock isn't Hitchcock without his cameraman and you know stuff like that yeah exactly so but, I mean I think it's a very natural impulse from from the point of view of a fan too not just the media I mean okay you're a crazy fan perhaps you actually have everyone memorized but I think <laughs> the average person you know you you listen to music and you you want to know who wrote the song. You know, you don't necessarily want to learn all of the names of the violist, violinists in the orchestra. You know what the composer, you know the, the composer's name maybe and the conductor's name. That's why the conductor gets so much credit for an orchestra, even though like the musicians are doing a lot of the work. Um, it's good to have a name to fixate your warm fuzzies on. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's natural. Oh no, it's totally natural, and, and I, I'm certainly not against it. I mean, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's fine. I, I guess it's just that it does make it harder to. Um, to talk about this stuff in a precise way sometimes. Yeah. And, right. and, and that's why I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying people shouldn't get credit for creating that environment, definitely. Or, or, or I mean, it's fine if Ken Levine mm -hmm. is like the guy who, who talks about Bioshock or, mm -hmm. or the, new, the new, um, new game they're doing. Um, but yeah, I know that, I know it's just, I'm always fascinated, for example, on DVD documentaries when, you know, Martin Scorsese's talking about, he's like, yeah, you know, I mean, 
everybody talks about my editing, but my editor is doing that, right? <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, and I somehow, somehow no, matter, no, no, matter how much, no matter how much you deny it, it just comes across as sort of endearingly humble. Like, no one actually, no <laughs> yeah. one actually ever, ever believes that you mean it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like, oh, what a great artist is giving other people credit. Isn't that wonderful? And it's like, I'm giving them credit because they did it and not me. Oh, isn't, that one, isn't, it, isn't it great? Oh, cute. <laughs> I think that's really interesting because, I mean, collaboration is great, but, it, but the coherence, the collaboration and the pointed coherence, the, the fact that it feels so yeah. so coherent and that it feels like there's a driver in the seat, I think. Is, yeah, is but the that person is less sort of like, you know, like making all the decisions or even sort of, it's not even like writing the Bible, though I mean certainly there are projects that have the Bible, right? But And it helped in the case of Thief, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Um, that there was a lot of that. that there was a lot of documentation like, like you were saying was not used or, or not, not directly in the game, but yeah. it was fleshing out the world for the writers. Um, but it's it's sort of its own its own skill set, right? Of which is which is a lot. You know, your 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 mention of a of a conductor in an orchestra, right? I think is an apt one, right? Because because the, the 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 sort of piece as a whole emerges from the coordination of all these elements, and that is that is its own skill, and and the way that you go about coordinating them is gonna is going to color the the final result in certain ways, right? Uh, I mean, I'm sure that that were I, you know. A you know claimed trained classical music you know connoisseur right like that I could t I could tell the same piece conducted by one guy as opposed to another by his conducting style right um, and yet it's the same piece and and it's like it's it's being synthesized from all these individual musicians with their own style but you know the the sort of central intelligence of the of the piece is still sort of coming through. Yeah, I mean, it's something that, it's just, you know, kind of continuing with it. That's something that we kind of run into at Gambit a lot. It, I just think about my last two summers, where the first summer, the problem with the team was, and it was a small team, right? It was like eight people, but the problem with the team was there's no central vision. So then we spent this whole summer talking about, well, we have central vision, and the lesson I learned from this last summer is, if you get a team together with, like, it's like, you know, there's no magic to it. It's like, if you get a team together that has enough people who are mature enough Yes. to kind of do it, then they do it themselves. Like, they yes. please each other. And then, like, you don't have to go to a vision holder. You can, you yes. know, they, can, they, they become each other's vision holders for the whole thing. Well, and and a, so. huge, a huge part of, of that is people, people are always going to have certain disagreements. And, and one of the core values that the team has to share is, is, you know, valuing getting something done and resolving problems, right? As opposed to valuing like particular decisions that are involved in that. Right? And if, if you can if you can if, if, and that is a matter of maturity.